the people in pray and leave us in your hands. Gracious Lord, thank you. Thank you that here in this room there is eloquent testimony by their presence of the reality of your work among the peoples of the world. And thank you that that work also includes us who are here. And so we want to be part of that. We long to participate more fully, more authentically, more effectively in your mission, the mission that you are at work on in the world. Thank you for Steve. He's such a blessing to us, and he's such a galvanizing, catalyzing force for good in the mission and Christian community here in Aotearoa. So bless him, Lord. Give him energy, place on his heart the words to say to us, and may we hear from you as we listen to him in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, George. You can all hear me? Yes. yes. Kira Fano, thank you for inviting me to be with you here today. Um, I was here, I think, about eight years ago, and it's always a great joy to come to the Kari community. Do you sometimes get angry? Yes. Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do get angry, don't we? Um, I've just returned from Vanuatu, where I saw firsthand the experiences of the people of the community of Ambai who have been evacuated, uh, forced to leave their home where they've been for generations because of the volcano that erupted a couple of months ago. They are leaving, they are, they are being sent to other islands, and that's it, basically. They've left their home, they've left their animals to die, and I, I spoke with a number of the people there from Ambai who told me horrific stories of how they had to leave. But what was sad was not just the, the, their movement and evacuation, was to hear stories of how so much wealth, so much resources have been poured into Vanuatu to help the people of Ambai, but they are not reaching the people at the bottom. It makes you angry, doesn't it? People are, are you know, homeless, no food, uh, nothing to eat, nothing to uh, uh, support their children with, but resources have been given, but they don't get to the bottom. So we live in a, a crazy world today that is searching for justice and hope. Global culture today is marked by contrasts. We have more resources today, more skills, more knowledge, more personnel than we've ever had in the history of the, of, of the world. And yet the task of bringing shalom on earth just seems to be fleeting. It seems to grow bigger. Although we claim to be a pluralistic society, persecution of Christians have reached appalling levels. Although we claim to be in a world of freedom, children are being sold into slavery and prostitution. Although we claim to be uh, in a world of um, you know, huge resources, there's widespread starvation, while we have massive food, food wastages. While the church in the majority of the world continues to grow phenomenally, the gap between the rich and the poor seems to increase. Why is it the church changing the world? Now, I know there are great things happening. Mission organizations, the ones represented, they are doing some great stuff. Don't get me wrong. <coughs> but could we be doing more things? Or could we be doing things differently? What well, it seems to me is that mission efforts over the last century, mainly by the Western world, have focused at the bottom. And the people in the margins, the poor, the marginalized. Now, that's great, it's fantastic stuff, and it's, it's noble work. But it seems to me sometimes like it's ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Is there another strategy? I've recently watched the film, The Whistleblower, based on the true story of Catherine Bobak, a cop from Nebraska who accepts an offer to join the UN peacekeeping mission in Bosnia. While there, she's, she's gone there with her heart to try and rescue all these people who I need, and she discovered that underage children are being sold into sex trade. While she presents her evidence to her superiors, hoping for some way of dealing with it, she is fired. And as she finds out later, she discovered that the police and the UN peacekeepers themselves are deeply involved in the issue. It's a film that fills you with rage at structural injustice. How are we to respond as followers of Jesus? Well, we have another whistleblower in the Bible, Jesus himself. Turn with me to Matthew 21, 
verse 12 to 15. You can turn to your Bible, if you've got this good old Bible flipping the pages, or you've got your phone, or you, if you're like Moses, you've got your tablet. You can Matthew 21, verse 12 to 15. New International Reader's Version. Jesus entered the temple courtyard. He began to drive out all those who were buying and selling there. He turned over the tables of people who were exchanging money. He also turned over the benches of those who were selling doves. He said to them, it is written the uh, that the Lord said, my house will be called a house where people can pray, but you are making it a den of robbers. Blind people, those who are disabled, came to Jesus at the temple, and there he healed them. The chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did. They also saw the children in the temple courtyard shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. But when they saw all this, they became angry. Jesus, the whistleblower. The event is recorded in all the Gospels. It seems to be important. But in the synopsis, Mark, uh, Matthew and Luke, the incident seems to happen at the end of Jesus' ministry. It's actually considered that this action by Jesus could have led to his arrest and his ultimate execution. He has come to Jerusalem, he arrives at the temple and he sees this sight that makes him really angry. It's very unusual for Jesus to sort of take the law in his hands. He overturns the tables of those changing money and driving out those who are buying and selling. What's going on here? There are four different ways scholars have interpreted this incident. One way is to see it as a religious event that is meant to cleanse the temple of impurities, whether commercial or religious. Secondly, it's seen as a messianic event intended to include the Gentiles into the um, scope of the temple's activities. Thirdly, it could be seen as a prophetic event seeking to announce, where Jesus is seeking to announce the destruction of the temple. Mark himself seems to frame it around the cursing of the fig tree. Or it could be seen as a political event intended to disrupt the commercial and religious activities of the temple because it had become oppressive and exploitive. Whatever approach or combination of approaches you take, um, it seems to me that the actions and the pronouncements of Jesus is an act of social justice. Jesus' action here appears to attack the oppressive political and economic system that is found its center in the temple. The action involving violence against the exploiters of the people is an act on structural evil. <clears throat> His attack on the money changers and bar sellers was more than an attack on business people who are doing simple business. It wasn't aimed at the defilement of the temple, but it seems to have been attacking the past structure of the Jewish society at the time. See, the temple basically operated under the control of the old priestly aristocracy. It basically was the religious, the political, the economic center of the Jewish people. Now Jesus seems, if you look through the gospel, to be uh, very regularly uh, seeking to bring God's kingdom by attacking the dominant system, political system or religious system that um, you know, seems to have kept the poor people poor. What's going on here? The pilgrims would come to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice. But if you found yourself with an, with a, an animal um, that uh, was not good enough according to the standards of the priest, then you had to buy an animal uh, that was acceptable. <clears throat> and of course, people had made business uh, of trying to sell, buy and sell. They were providing a good service. That's all right. But you could have been in a fix because um, while that was great, you may not have had the right currency. And so they had you know, foreign exchange uh, business people over there trying to help people to find the right um, the right coinage uh, to be able to uh, buy the animals. Plus, also, you also had to pay the temple tax, so you also need the right money for it. So, I mean, it seems like it's all making perfect sense. However, because of corruption and extortion, taking advantage of those in need, there seems to have been a serious problem operating at the temple. One scholar says that changing money, um, uh, instead of changing money at the same rate that was given, some money changers would charge almost a whole day's wage um, and charge you another fee if you, if you, you, know, you know, to get you the right change. Uh, and forget about the sacrifices that might be done during Passover. Sometimes the prices for animals for appropriate sacrifice would mean that somebody had to give up several months' wa uh, wages. So it was, it was oppressive. And this makes Jesus angry. 
Jesus, by his action, is basically saying that the true social crooks are not those bandits operating in the Judean, uh, Judean wilderness. No, they are prominent people right at the temple. The corrupt and oppressive domination of the people through taxation and tribute seems to represent the real social violence at the time of Jesus. And yet it is masked by piety and religious duty. He calls it a den of robbers, a safe heaven for thieves and the Roman collaborators who run the temple. You can tell that uh, who he's attacking because the, the leaders of the temple are not happy about what Jesus has done. He said the authorities against him and perhaps led to his crucifixion. Remember that the temple was a place where people would find justice. One of the brilliant passages in the Bible is 1 Kings 8, verse 22, that where Solomon is dedicating the temple and saying what the temple is to be. Not just a house of prayer, but a place where people would find justice. And yet it seems to have stopped being that at Jesus' time. I'm surprised, you know, really intrigued by, the, by verse 14. After Jesus has cleaned out the, the temple, verse 14, it says that the, the, the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them. Beautiful contrast there of, you know, driving out people and yet people coming to him and him providing him. So while he's displaying judgment, he's displaying grace. I'd like to suggest that the two things are connected. If you're going to lift the people, the poor at the bottom, you've got to deal with those in power that keep the poor people poor. It's not good enough just going to the bottom and dealing with the people at the bottom. You've got to deal with those who keep poor people poor. To lift the oppressed, you need to deal with the oppressor. To rescue the Israelites from Egypt, God needed to deal with the slave drivers, the Egyptians. Jesus is a social revolutionary. He's a radical. He wants to change the status quo. And of course, that gets him in a lot of trouble. It's the kind of stuff that people who might try to implement this way would likely be persecuted or even killed. Sounds familiar? Many Old Testament prophets ex did exactly this, and some of them ended up in trouble because of that. So how, what can we learn from Jesus about how we respond to the great challenge that facing us today? This massive poverty, injustice around the world. Three quick things. I think we need to recover holy outrage. Too much information about the brokenness of our world seems to make our emotions numb. You know, you can read the television, you can read the news, it just doesn't make you feel anything. You know, like it's become normal. We need to feel outraged by what we see around us today. The story is told of um, 200 women in Kabete, about 10 kilometers north of Nairobi, I come from Kenya, who marched seven kilometers from the local police station to the trading center. They had gone to the police station to seek justice and they found they could not get justice, so they went to the trading center. They raided drinking dens and destroyed equipment used to manufacture illicit brews, while the men watched it all. 200 women. Drink, they said, you know, drinking has messed up our men and sons, they lamented. The women even beat up some of the men, forcing them to flee. They even caught up with the chief, but he ran for his life before they caught up with him. <laughs> now, what made these women, 200 women from Kenya, able to muster up so much courage to physically confront the men in the community? It is the zeal for their homes and their families that motivated them. What is it that drives you? What is it that creates holy restlessness in you, that drives you to your knees, that, is, that makes you want to take risks for God? What is it? See, we live in a world where organizations have become so risk averse, where safety has become the dominant motivation, health and safety. You know, who is gonna go anywhere in the world if we are to follow all these rules? Now, they, don't get me wrong, they're important, but will compassion and holy anger lead us to take more risks for God. We need holy outrage. Secondly, we need to speak. Jesus speaks. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of robbers. He calls people, you know, what they are. So the problem today is the problem of our silence, our lack of response. 
We've lost confidence in the power of the gospel to change lives. Shall we hide away from the controversially non-politically correct issues? Shall we grow a spine and speak against him? Jesus doesn't seem to fear offending people. The gospel is by nature offensive. As the Bible is being pushed out of the public space, who are the people speaking out? What will future generations say that we did in our time to protect the gospel? Have we lost in the power of the gospel? Where is the faith in the marketplace, the public square? Are we equipping folk in our churches to speak confidently of God's truth? Are we living lives that bear witness to the gospel in all sectors of society? We need to speak. It's time to speak. Where is God calling you to speak out? So we need holy outrage, but we also need to speak. But finally, we need to engage in mission from above. Yes, there are those called to go to the margins of society and reach out to the people who are there, but I, I truly believe, especially in the Western society, that where we need to be engaging is mission from above. Engaging the people of influence. Jesus acts by dealing with the root cause of the problem by engaging the influencers. He brings freedom to the captive by dealing with those who enslave. Who are the people of peace in the various sectors of society that could bring about God's kingdom? Are you engaging them? Is God calling you to engage in one of those places? I spend lots of time speaking to uni students and, and people looking at you know whole career path and wondering where what career would be the most helpful for them in mission. And why in the past it used to be nurses and doctors and teachers. And, and those are vital careers. It seems to me that we miss out on those who do international relations and the diplomats and the policy makers and politicians. Who's mobilizing those people who can make inf who can who can engage structures of, of power in our society, who can go and work as diplomats in our world today and help shape policies that uh, will help poor uh, people find freedom. You see, our vocation, whether engineering or artificial intelligence or diplomatic mission, is the primary means that God's given us to serve him. Mission is not just living in a slum somewhere in Asia and serving the urban poor. That's vital, but mission is more than that. How are our churches raising and developing and releasing and equipping people of influence, business people, lawyers, diplomats, policymakers, and seeing their role as vital in mission? When was the last time in your church you commissioned business people as missionaries? Who are those who are seeking to engage with those who make decisions in the high places? I speak to you today because you have influence. Don't give up your influence. May the Lord help us to step into a new place of mission work today that will be culture-defining, hope and justice-bringing, and jesus living. We need William Wilberforce's of 21st century who will engage the centers of power in New Zealand and around the world in order to see the gospel breaking structural injustice and the poor finding justice, freedom, hope, and truth that can only be found in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us. I think we need prayer <laughs> to know how to respond. May God bless us with restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that we may seek truth boldly and love deep within our heart. May God bless us with holy anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may tirelessly work for justice, freedom, and peace among all people. May God bless us with the gift of tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, or the loss of all that they cherish so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and transform their pain into joy. May God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we really can make a difference in this world so that we are able, with God's grace, to do what others ca claim cannot be done. Mm -hmm. Lord, give us your grace to know how to respond to you. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.